Welcome to the Genealogy Happy Hour, a place where new family historians can learn to document their family histories and celebrate their new discoveries. I'm Amy. And I'm Penny. And we're here to help you discover your family tree from the beginning. Welcome to episode 52. Today's episode, we are going to be talking with renowned author and one of our favorites, Nathan Dylan Goodwin, about his new book, The Sterling Affair. We're also going to cover some other things that he brings up in the book that were of great interest to us, which is uh, something regarding DNA and, of course, ordering documents in England. So we'll add a little bit of genealogy research tips in there, along with a discussion on his book. But first, we have the wine. Of course, Amy? Of course we have wine. Today, we are drinking um, Chateau Smith from Charles Smith. It is a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from Washington State. It's um, elegant, full-bodied red, so it's got a lot of that berry and tannin, light tannins, but a lot of berry in it. And um, I ran into it um, at the local wine store here in um, Tampa, and I, I think it's wonderful. Um, but you, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to find, too, so uh, in high demand, but um, I think it's a really great red. Well, I'm looking forward to trying it whenever we can get back together because this month is April and Amy and I are social distancing and we are podcasting from our own homes this time, trying it out. We are not techie at all, so we're crossing our fingers that this turns out well. I Hopefully, I, I think we've got it. I think we got it together. So, yes, we are having um, happy hour um, by the internet. Yeah. So, all right. So let's um, get right to um, our discussion um, with Nathan Dylan Goodwin. Well, we would like to welcome Nathan Dylan Goodwin to our podcast, and we're going to talk to him about The Sterling Affair, which is his latest book. And I found it to, to be so wonderful and so complicated. There are so many storylines. So, Nathan, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me again. And um, we're just going to jump right in. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, how did this story evolve? Because it is so complicated. Did you did you kind of have it mostly planned out, partly planned out? Or did some things come about in your research? Because I know, as you post online, you do a lot of the research that um, Morton does. Did things come up that alter the story? Yeah, so um, I, I kind of have known for quite a while, probably two or three years, I wanted to do at some point uh, a spy-related story because I thought it kind of lends itself completely to to, uh, to Morton and genealogy because, you know, if someone's trying to hide their identity, it kind of it fits really well. So I've always had that in the back of my mind. Um, and then whilst I was researching uh, the and writing The Wicked Trade, um, and I was at National Archives, I kind of looked just tentatively to see what was out there record-wise, because obviously um, records for MI5 and MI6, there's not too many of them for obvious reasons, you know, all the security services, um, but there are some, and they're slowly revealing uh, more and more. And so uh, once I finished uh, with the Wicked Trade, I then went completely into the doing the research for the Sterling Affair, um, and I kind of had a general idea, but uh, the story always it evolves uh, by itself, seemingly, and the characters kind of do things that I hadn't thought of. Um, and then, you know, I'd come across a new record, and I think, oh, that'd be really good to tie that in. And sometimes I didn't quite know where the story was going, but, uh, you know, I then would have to go and find another record or another uh, document or something to kind of see where it, uh, how Morton was going to manage to solve it. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it always is. I probably knew maybe 30% of the book when I started. And I, when I started writing, that was kind of a bit scary. It's like, well, where's the other, where's the other 70% coming from? Um, but it just, it just does. It does happen. So how long does it take you to just research the, um, the historical setting portion of, of, your, of the mm -hmm. book? And then, of course, then you've got to, uh, is that what, that's the 30%? 
Yeah, so the, the research, if I get the research right, mm -hmm. then the book tends to write itself mm -hmm. because I've got everything, I know everything, it was, you know, not everything, but, you know, I know enough to get on with it. Um, the research is usually three to four months, uh, just with that's reading books about the time period. So for the Sterling Affair, it's set during the Suez Crisis, so books in the like, 50s, 60s. Um, and looking at documents and going to national archives and going to libraries and museums and wherever I need to go to try to get as much done as I can. But inevitably, as I'm writing, I think, oh, I need, still need to buy another book or I need to go back to the National Archives or I need to download another document. Um, but I try to get as much done at the beginning as I, as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and then the story, the plot then develops out of, out of the research. And again, I'll, I'll come up with something, I'll hit on something, oh, that's a... An interesting story, mm -hmm. and um, Morton. Everything that Morton does in the books, I do first. Okay, all right. So you, speaking of the the records that um, that Morton uses in, in this one, um, you know, you bring up the fact that um, you know for the. Um, the uh, MI5, MI6, a lot of those were redacted. So you might think, oh my gosh, this is great. Here's a record. And then you go into it and everything is black <laughs> or blank. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Are any of those records now, um, I mean, have they unclassified or declassified any of that? Or is it still mostly classified? It, it's, it seems to me a little bit hit and miss. Like mm -hmm. I, I can't really see why some are redacted obviously if it's redacted i can't see why they redacted it but there are there are parts that aren't redacted and then you suddenly see one where there's part of a document but they've put uh, like a sticker over the person's name or mm -hmm. a key sentence in the middle of it and you're thinking what did that say but right. it doesn't seem to be like anything from a certain date is now out of classic uh, there are things relating to the um Perfumo affair i don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard of that but it's right. a big scandal mm -hmm. here yep. um with, with an mp in the, the early mm -hmm. 60s and you know most of those documents are now out there but there are still parts that are, are redacted and you know i, I don't know why because mm -hmm. i can't see those right. but so it's a bit hit and miss so you yeah you do go i went to national archives and i ordered a document thinking this is brilliant this is exactly what i need yep. and then you turn the page and it says no 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 <laughs> no and so you and you, you then lose the context of it because mm -hmm. they they put like if they bind a, a document together with all the related letters and documents and correspondence, um, they put it in chronological order, but of course they then, it's just blank pages, so you then start mm -hmm. to lose the thread of what you're reading and you can't see who it's addressed to or who it's from and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so um, it's interesting. Yeah. It's challenging. Challenging, for sure. That's Absolutely. Well, Morton uses some, um, some other very interesting um, records that we really wouldn't think of to go to first for, in genealogy. Um, one of them I thought was, was brilliant was the, um, the Aero Club records, where he was able to go in and look at um, one of the characters' um, uh, pilot's license and get a lot of information <laughs> off of that, a, a lot of genealogical information off of that, which was not something that uh, you know, we would think of. But I thought it was very interesting using the photograph and by reading the photograph and going and finding the photographer and um, the, the type of flowers that were used in the corsage, Morton was able then to locate a record. I thought that was a little out there, but um, when it came to the floral <laughs> corsage part, but <laughs> um, I also thought it was it was kind of brilliant because he was able to track down that photographer in that time period. So those were very unusual. Yeah. How did you how did you <laughs> come up how did you come up with that? Yeah, I, I kind of I I knew I needed him to be able to identify um, a photograph, and it did, it did take me a while to think this needs to be plausible even though it's not mm -hmm. that likely that you could do that i thought mm -hmm. it needs to be plausible so um I, it took me a while of trying to figure things out and thinking and then actually doing that those taking those steps so if you mm -hmm. if you put just a person's first name into free bmd and the registration district like how many names does that come up with right. reasonably and mm -hmm. if you went to an archive uh, like London Metropolitan Archives, um, how many of those churches would you hope to find in there to be able to locate the marriages? So mm -hmm. it is doable. <laughs> just, just. Just, yeah. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, and, just, and the photo just happened to be taken outside the church and he was able to, you know, but yeah, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> 
It was good. <laughs> um, definitely something. I mean, we've had a photo challenge here on um, our podcast where we've taken a photograph um, and it had the name on the back and then trying to, to do the research on that. So um, definitely that's um, it's a good challenge for anyone, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, when you are, uh, or when Morton slash you are ordering documents, you know, I know we talked about this uh, when we talked to you before, how quickly he gets them. Super yeah. fast. They show yeah. <laughs> up. Um, and that's not always the case, but are you ordering them from the National Archives or from the GRO, which is the what General Regis Register Office? Yes. Yeah. So do you mean like uh, birth, marriage and death certificates? Correct. Yeah, so um, the, the way I order them and the way Morton orders, orders them is, uh, yeah, so you, you get the details from Ancestry or FreeBMD or wherever, um, and then you then go to the GRO website. And if I'm ordering for me, then I use the, the standard service, which is um, between, if it's uh, a PDF uh, document, then it's like £6.50, I think it is. Um, but if it's a postal one, it's 11 whereas Morton uses the 24-hour service which is a, a lot more money but then you get it the next day that, so that service exists but i don't think many um people use it unless you're very rich or you need to write a story where you've got to have the answers quickly got it well i'm um uh, after reading the book and i think i thought i've got a lot of uh ancestors on my husband's side that i needed to research mostly to find out parents um or a definite birth date so I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to order one. And uh, I went, like you said, onto Ancestry and got the information. And they do have a little link there that says, order your document here. No, and don't I, do that. Put, don't do that, because it's no. like 30 bucks. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not paying $30. <laughs> no. So I, I did go to the GRO site, which is, I wrote it down so everybody can know, you know uh, gro.gov.uk. And then you can order your document using the information from Ancestry. Yes. Um, it was for me. It said seven pounds for the PDF and eleven yeah. if I wanted the actual document. Yeah, that's right. So I ordered it. I haven't gotten it yet. It's been a while. So I'm assuming okay. maybe they're closed because of. I oh, maybe I haven't on. ordered any during lockdown. So yeah, that could be it. Yeah, that's I'm I'm guessing because every time I go to check and you can check on your order, yeah. um, it says in process. Uh, so you, it's about it's a, about a week for the postal full full copies. It's about a week over here, so um, yeah, they must be uh, staff shortages. Or, I think yeah, so. Or maybe because it's been about two weeks, and I thought it would be. It, it said it, I should have gotten it in like six days. I think Amy and I figured out. Yeah. Um, and I haven't so and it, but it still says in process so I'm still hopeful I'll, I'll get it one of these days but I was really excited about that I was like okay working like Morton doing it <laughs> um, and the other thing that he or that you introduced me to in this book is the DNA painter and he Morton uses it quite a bit in this book yes. and I was like, what is the DNA painter so I had to look it up I registered on there. I watched an hour-long video um, by the creator, uh, who yep. is Johnny Pearl. Johnny Pearl. Yeah. yeah, he did a great video. Very, very easy to understand. So I get in. Unfortunately for me, I only have one relative that has uploaded their DNA to GEDmatch, where I could use that information on the DNA painter. Everybody else is in Ancestry and is just, um, yeah. hasn't moved it. But it is, it's fun. I could see if I had a lot of things, you know, a lot of people that I could merge that into. It's it's really fascinating. How did you find that? I can't even remember now, because I um, I think it's probably, I met Johnny a few years ago, I think at uh, Roots Tech, maybe three years ago, when it, this, the website was just kind of, uh, just released and he um, you know that chart of um, different centimorgan amounts that Blaine came up with he basically made an interactive version so if you type the number of centimorgans uh, that you share DNA with somebody um, then it, it, it highlights the boxes of how that could be all the, all the potential options and I think I think first of all I used it for that most of all to see then how could how, how am I I used it myself as well as uh, in the book how could I be related to this person 
Um, and from there, he's kind of developed these various tools on there. There's the family tree tools, but the um, I, I really like the, the Wato tool. I think Americans call it Wato, um, but yeah, uh, the Wato tool. It's like, what are the odds? So it tells you what statistically the chances that you're that somebody can be a parent, for example. If you're trying to look for an adoptee's parent, and you're you can put the target person in and say what's the chances that it's this person, and you need several. Uh, Member, member of the family to be tested to be able to do that um, and it kind of just gives you a, a bit of a, a, a clue as to where to look so I yeah I really love the website for me and for, for Morton. So is Morton going to be using more and more DNA research as the books develop? I think I think so I think it's you know like when I started with um, Hide in the Past I'm very glad I dated each of the books so if someone picks up Hide in the Past today it says in it 2013, and so they would because some authors in this genre they they say like it's set today, you know, they say present day. And uh, if you pick up the first book, you'd go, well, why isn't he doing DNA tests? You know, so I'm glad you know. So that that evolution with DNA um, being used more and more, I think it's you can see it through the series, you know. Um, so I think so. It's kind of you know it's a, a key tool really for us now, particularly for trying to solve you know crimes and. Uh, mysteries in the past. It's uh, it's something that I can't really avoid. I, I love it anyway myself. I, I think it's fascinating. Right. I mean, now the, the forensic um, DNA um, in in forensic um, crime work. You know, you've brought that in, mm. which is right now um, very um, now and what's happening in um, yeah. in the, in the DNA. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, you'll definitely. Um, be able to see that uh, how the DNA has developed in genealogy um, through Morton's um, own work. So it should be more to come then. Yeah. yeah. And in this book, in this book, Nathan, the side story of Morton's family, I know in other books past his family um, history has been um, kind of a big chunk. This one was just like a little, little side story. Mm -hmm that intentional or did the other did the other one just get to be too big because it was pretty big <laughs> yeah so, so i mean obviously yeah you know it's not giving too much away to say that uh Morton was adopted and so you know from the beginning of the series up till really the last book so um the wicked trade it was kind of his journey of trying to find his biological family and i felt like that it's kind of gone Again, I can't say too much in case people haven't read some books, but I, I think by the Wicked Trade, that kind of that was wrapped up, and I didn't want to over egg that anymore. And mm -hmm. um, but there needs to be some kind of a, a sub subplot there with his personal life. So um, there's this mm -hmm. new thread that's going to continue. So the next book uh, will pick up on that. Oh, that'll be exciting! There you go. There's a yeah, teaser. So, yeah. It was a good one. It was a good yeah. one. Yeah. But I have to say, I'm uh, I. I've started to uh, write the next uh, book, and then I've been thinking, it's been really bothering me the last few days, being in lockdown now for three weeks, I'm thinking, I really should write uh, a Morton uh, being in lockdown as well. And um, so I'm, I'm midway through now, a story where he's it's set like right now, and he's in lockdown, and he's got to solve a mystery uh, whilst in lockdown about the, um, the Spanish flu. Um, but I'm going to put it on my website. It's going to be like an interactive one where you get to choose some of the paths he takes. So it's something different. Oh, that'll be fun. Very yeah. cool. So there There's an exclusive for you. I like it. Awesome. Like Thank it. you. No, that's great. Well, it is challenging right now. Uh, like Penny said, she's still waiting on her documents to get here. And yeah. uh, here in the States, um, most of the libraries are shut down, so we can't get the obituaries and some of those things that you kind of depend yeah. on. And the other states, you know, vital records are hit or miss depending on what they're doing. So it is much, much more challenging uh, during this time. Yeah. So that would be cool. Good idea. Well, and to wrap this up, we have to ask you about the scones in your book. <laughs> That more, okay, and I will say this, Amy's a little obsessed about it too, but when I first read when he went in and tried the pear and gorgonzola scone, yes, I've wanted that scone ever since that was mentioned. <laughs> the other ones were a little different. Peanut butter, <laughs> peanut butter, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but where, um, 
um, I guess I want to know is how did you incorporate or where did you get the idea to even bring that in and when are you going to be <laughs> opening your yeah. scone shop? Yeah, who's, who's, who's <laughs> whipping up these scones? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to run that scone shop, but I think I would just eat all my profits because uh, I just I just I just love scones and I just thought it'd be quite you know, something quirky you know there was this a craze a few years ago for cupcakes and there were cupcake shops right. popping up every and I thought yeah. a scone shop would be something different so um so I had to, I had Morton's brother set, set one up here which isn't it isn't real unfortunately um and so the flavors I just thought I once had um a gorgonzola ice cream with a warm pear and it sounds horrible but it was really delicious. And so I thought oh, that might work in a scone. Well, we are going to be looking for, on your website, for um, your um, Spanish flu um, and see how um, Morton handles that while he's in lockdown. And you'll let us know when that's um, it's up and going? I will, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I will tell you. Awesome. Very I'll good. I'll put it on the social media page. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Excellent. Very well, as always, it's wonderful to talk to you about you. We look forward to the next Morton Barrier mystery when it comes out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. So we heard it here first. There's going to be, uh, Nathan is going to be putting out a Morton Farrier interactive um, story on his website soon and as soon as we have more information about that we will um, post that on social media won't we Penny? We sure will. Awesome. Well it's always good to talk to Nathan and uh, we just love his books so you can um, go to our website we have um, the Sterling Affair up there you can um, find out more about it on the website and um, where you can get your copy. So until next time Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Please email us with any questions or comments at genealogyhappyhour at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.genealogyhappyhour.com, for additional resources, books, and wines. Don't forget to drink responsibly. And never drink around genealogical documents.